All right, here we are. Um, so anyway, uh, <laughs> what I'd like to do here now, I think I forgot to tell you that I wanted us to do the chapter eight problem set today as well as nine. So uh, I apologize for that, but I'd like to get that out of the way because um, we want to at some point start talking about a second midterm. And it's going to be exclusively based on um, chapters five through nine. Okay. Five through nine. And so uh, in order to get to that point, what we have to do, of course, is go through the problem sets, which we haven't completed yet. And then we will do the sample midterm and then we can re be ready for the actual test. So uh, five through nine is the second midterm. And then um we'll do chapter 10 and chapter 11 and chapter 12 and then that will be the end of the course so um but of course that's down the road today i want to focus on chapters uh the chapter eight and nine problem sets and then probably there'll be time left over and we can start chapter 10 which is our overview of financial markets. So the focus of the class is shifting, as I think we discussed last time from what we've been doing to um, more financial monetary policy, interest rates, that type of thing. So, so let, why don't we open up the chapter eight problem set and start looking at it. All right, let me get that open. Hold on one second. Uh, oh, wait, I think it's already here. Hold on. There we go. Okay, there's the chapter eight problem set. So let's start to take a look at that and see how we did. And then we can carry on with chapter nine. All right. So let's begin at the beginning. So what exactly is potential GDP? All right. Oh, before we continue, let me save this before I lose it. All right, so potential GDP, remember, this is what the economy is capable of producing when there's no resources being wasted. In other words, um, there's no cyclical unemployment. Okay, so in other words, potential GDP is what the economy is capable of producing when all resources are used as efficiently as possible or you can alternatively explain that as um, there is no cyclical unemployment. Okay, <clears throat> so that's how it's generally uh, measured. When we reach the point where there's no cyclical unemployment, whatever the economy is capable of producing, um, that is what we mean by potential GDP. All right, now the production function, we've already seen uh, this in our example with the soda factory. Um, basically what it refers to is the mathematical relationship between the quantity of labor employed and the output produced holding all other resources constant. All right, so when we say resources, of course, we mean labor and capital, I'm sorry, land and capital. So in other words, in the short run, when the only thing that we can change is the amount of labor that we're using, um, this is the mathematical relationship that shows us how much output we can produce at different, different levels of labor. Okay, so if we hire more workers, um, this will show us how much more output we can produce. And that's how we can decide what would be the optimal amount of labor to hire. All right, now, of course, 
the problem is that we face the law of diminishing returns. Um, the law of diminishing returns refers to the um, <clears throat> fact that as a variable input is used, like labor, um, initially output increases very rapidly. Then it increases at a slower rate. And eventually reaches a maximum value after which it starts to decline. All right, so we keep hiring more people with the same resources. At first, the extra output will be growing very quickly as they start to specialize in different tasks. But after a while, what starts to happen is they run out of equipment to use, they run out of space, and output starts to not only grow more slowly, if anything, it actually starts to turn down. And so this always happens in the short run when we only have one variable input and all the rest are fixed. All right, now, of course, we saw that example uh, that we all are very familiar with. Um, as if you try to study too much at the same time, you know what ends up happening. Initially, you're very productive, but fairly soon that productivity starts to fall off very quickly. What you're experiencing there is what we will call diminishing returns. Every extra hour of studying is doing you less and less uh, good because of course you're getting tired, you know, it's harder to concentrate. So that's going to happen anytime we try to combine <clears throat> just a single variable input with fixed other inputs like capital and land. <laughs> now, when technology improves, of course that increases our ability to produce goods and services, productivity rises, and so the total product curve shifts up. It's like that we can produce more output with the same resources. All right, so in other words, if let's say, remember the, event, the example of our soda factory, if we buy better equipment, the same laborers can produce more soda because the equipment is better. So the output will increase at every level of labor and therefore the entire curve will shift up. Now here it's saying, what is true of the points on that curve? Well, what exactly does that mean? Well, if you look at the curve, let me just sketch it in here for you. All the points in this curve, let's say these are points A, B, and C. Uh, let's, let me also draw a point D in here. Okay, so points A, B, and C all represent points of maximum efficiency. In other words, what that means that for that level of labor, this is the absolute maximum amount of output that you can produce so that nothing is being wasted. Okay, um, but a point like D, which is inside the curve, represents a point where resources are being wasted. because we can easily move up to the curve without increasing our use of labor. So in other words, interior points, as they're called, are points of inefficient production. Okay, so in other words, you wanna be on that curve. Even if the, you know, the decision as to where, whether to be at A, B, or C depends on a lot of other factors, like how much can we sell the soda for and how much are we paying the workers? But for sure, um, all of those points represent efficiency. So you might wanna choose A, B, or C, but you would never choose D because that means that something is being wasted. All right, so, oh, so that leads us, I didn't really notice that was there. Point F or question F says, what is true of points below the curve? Well, at all points below the curve, Resources are being wasted. So these points are said to be inefficient. 
Now, at the same time, what about points above the curve? Like, let's say I put in here a point E. Well, that would be nice if we could reach point E, but right now with the resources that we have and the technology that we have, that's not possible. So these points are said to be unattainable. Um, with our given resources and technology. It would be nice, but if you notice that the curve shifts up because technology improves, we can start to reach points like E. Okay, but right now that's out of our reach. All right, now why is the demand curve for labor downward sloping? Okay, well, um, as real wages rise, the quantity demanded of labor falls and vice versa. Okay. So in other words, if labor becomes more expensive, employers will look to find ways to do um, to produce goods with less labor and more capital or other resources. Just like for any other good we've ever studied, um, as the price goes up, people buy less of it. So the same thing is true here. Employers will hire less labor if it becomes more expensive. And of course, that's because it eats into their profits. Now, on the other hand, with the supply curve, as real wages rise, the quantity of demand, uh, of, uh, sorry, the quantity supplied of labor increases since people um, are more willing to work or willing to work more hours if their salaries increase. All right, so it's just as simple as that. The more you get paid, the more you want to work. I mean, that's just the reality, of course. Um, so in other words, when wages go up, you might be willing to work more hours. You might be willing to work overtime. People who are unemployed might push harder to get a job, that kind of thing. And so before you know it, more people are working because the salaries are higher. Now here, what happens to the equilibrium wage if the demand for labor increases for some reason? All right, so we can have real wages here and the quantity of labor here. And uh, so the, we have the traditional supply and demand curves. And let's say that labor becomes more productive so that employers want to hire more workers. Well, what's going to happen is the demand curve will shift to the right. Okay, so just like with any other demand curve, if the demand for a product increases, the demand curve shifts to the right. And so as a result, two things will happen. The equilibrium wage goes up and the equilibrium quantity also goes up. So there's more people are working um, and the wages are higher because again, because if labor becomes more productive, um, employers have a more powerful incentive to hire them. So wages will start to rise in order to attract more laborers into the market. On the other hand, the people drop out of the workforce. So the supply drops. Um, well, then we're gonna see a very opposite reaction so imagine that you know the economy is not doing so well and people start dropping out of the workforce and the supply drops. So we can visualize this by shifting the supply curve to the left. And so what's happening is wages are actually going up because it's harder to find people. In fact, that's what a lot of employers are experiencing right now. A lot of people were not working because of COVID and a lot of them seem to be reluctant to come back to the workforce. And so they're finding shortages of labor in certain dis, um, industries 
And so wages are starting to creep up again because it's harder to find people. <clears throat> and so this is what we're seeing here. The supply drops and the wages will start to go up because it's harder for employers to find workers. All right, now, what is one of the most important assumptions on which classical economics is based? Well, basically with classical economics, everything is taken to be flexible, even in the short run, so that wages can actually drop if um, conditions warrant it. So, um, Let's see, hold on one second. Oh, here we are. Um, the most important way we can describe the assumptions of classical economics is that um, with classical economics, markets are said to be self-correcting. And that just means that uh, whenever a market is out of equilibrium, will correct itself immediately, uh, prices will adjust until the market is back in equilibrium. And this is expected to happen very, very quickly, uh, almost automatically. So as soon as uh, we see that there's an imbalance between supply and demand, either the price will rise or fall depending on the circumstances. And before you know it, we're right back in equilibrium again. So. With the classical economists, the assumption was that um, if there are, there are any deviations from equilibrium, they won't last for very long. So of course that means there's no need for government intervention because um, the problem will take care of itself very quickly. Okay, now, which school of economics calls for government intervention to reduce unemployment? That would be the Keynesians. To them, the government is the answer to everything. Uh, or the, I should say the Keynesian school of thought or whatever you want to call it, the Keynesians. Um, to them, government is like the answer to everything. So as soon as something goes wrong, that they want the government to step in and, and interfere. Um, the classical economists would have said that that's just ultimately self-defeating because they're only going to make things worse. Anyway, so which school of economics attributes the business cycle to fluctuations in the money supply? Well, the name says it all. That would be the monetarists. They attribute a, a lot of economic activity to fluctuations in the money supply. And so they had their day in the 80s. They were really, um, most policymakers were monetarists in those days. And so we had a very, very long successful uh, expansion throughout the 80s into the early 90s. Um, now, maybe not as much influence as they used to have, but still it's a very important school because um, the Fed does, to a large degree, follow what the monetarists would say that they should do, but they do sometimes um, take other steps that the monetarists would not recommend. Like um, during the credit crisis, when they started buying up assets from the banks, <clears throat> the monetarists would not have approved of that. But you know, the Fed felt like that's what they had to do to get the economy back on track. All right, well, anyway, so what is full employment? Um, as we've already seen, full employment occurs when there is no cyclical unemployment. That doesn't mean zero unemployment. It means that all the unemployment is attributable to other reasons, okay? Like, um, for example, the people who are unemployed have poor marketable skills um, or they're just temporarily in between jobs. So in other words, it's not due to the business cycle. All right, oh, I think that was the whole thing. Okay, good. So now we're ready for number nine. Oh, Fernando, yes. For that question, uh, just out of curiosity, um, couldn't we also say like, you know, full employment is when an individual is within the workforce and, you know, also like, you know, working and compensating with money or not compensating, earning money, or is it only specifically that answer? No, it's, it is formally defined as the point where there's no cyclical unemployment. So in other words, there's still unemployment. There's always going to be unemployment. But the question is, where is it coming from? Um, because we know there's always going to be frictional um, because it takes time for people to find new jobs. And that's just the reality. And then there's other people who just don't have very good job skills. Uh, people are like 
dropped out of high school, for example, and it can take them a very long time to find a new job, even if the economy is really booming. So, um, but cyclical unemployment is something the uh, policymakers can presumably do something about. For example, if there's a lot of cyclical unemployment, the Fed could lower interest rates or the government could cut taxes. So they try to do that, of course, to keep cyclical unemployment as low as possible, but um, their, their activities will no longer help when there's no more cyclical unemployment. Okay, in other words, lowering interest rates won't help reduce structural unemployment, for example, because the problem is something completely different. So that's why it's defined this way. It means that policymakers have reached their target <coughs> of eliminating all uh, cyclical unemployment. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Now let's get nine now here. Now, of course, nine. Uh, well, this one is a little short, but all right, let's look at nine. And then when we're done with this, we should have plenty of time to at least start chapter 10, which is again, our introduction to financial markets. So the focus of the class is gonna be a little bit different for the last three chapters. Um, we've been looking at unemployment and inflation, and now we're focusing more on financial considerations like um, the money supply, like interest rates, like uh, stock prices, that type of thing. All right, uh, hold on one second. I want to save this before I lose it. And of, of course, as usual, I'll be posting these solutions on uh, Moodle as soon as we're done. All right, here we go. So suppose that real GDP is $19 trillion in 2019 and $20 trillion in 2020. What was the real GDP growth rate in 2020? All right, so for something like this, um, what you're doing is you're taking the 2020 real GDP and you're subtracting the 2019 real GDP. And then you're dividing all of that by the 2019 real GDP. Okay, now everything's in trillions. We don't have to write out all those zeros. We can just write it as 20 minus 19 over 19. Oh, I almost forgot. We're supposed to multiply this by 100 to turn it into a percent. That's normally how it's done. All right, because, you know, it's, it's just um, when you hear a uh, read in... Um, or see on TV, like on Bloomberg TV, when they're talking about real GDP, their changes, they'll always refer to them as percentages rather than decimals. So we'll multiply this by 100. And so that works out to be approximately 0.0526 or 5.26%. So that means actual output of goods and services went up by 5.26%, because real, remember, is adjusted for inflation. Nominal GDP includes both um, actual increases in output, but also price increases. So it's a little bit deceiving. And this is why policymakers prefer to focus on real GDP. All right, now what about per capita? Now per capita is a little trickier because we're thinking in terms of how much output is there per person. So 2019 real per capita GDP means that we're taking 2019 real GDP and dividing it by the population. Okay, um, 19 trillion. This time they're different units, so we'll, we'll include all the numbers. 19 trillion over 310 million. When you chop out all those zeros, you end up with 61,290 per capita. And of course, per capita means per person. It literally means per head. It's a Latin word that means head, okay. We do the same thing for um, 2020. It's 2020 real GDP um, over, hold on one second. Um, oh yes, over the population in 2020. And that would be uh, 20 trillion over 320 million. 
which is $62,500. So it did go up, but maybe not as much as we, we might think, because remember, we have to take into account the population growth. So now the change, the percentage change, means that here we've got 2020 real per capita GDP minus 2019 real per capita GDP over, oh, I forgot a parenthesis over here. Uh, over 2019 real per capita GDP. All right, so that means we're gonna be comparing 62,500 with the 61,290 all over 61,290. Uh, oh yeah, one more thing. We probably should multiply this by 100. For the same reasoning, we wanna turn it into percentage. There we go. It's just easier for people to follow. All right, and that works out to be 1.97%. So if you notice, real per capita GDP went up more slowly than real GDP because the population grew more quickly than GDP did. So that reduces the per capita GDP to 1.97%. It's still strong. I mean, that's a good number, but it's not quite as strong as it appears when we look at the just the total of 5.26%. And a lot of economists think that really this is the better measure of um, standards of living because obviously you want everyone to share in the growth of the economy, but they're still both very good numbers. All right, now, when you wor worry is when it goes backwards, when it's negative, and that does happen sometimes. Um, potential real GDP, which has more than one name, by the way, sometimes it's called the natural level of GDP, um, occurs when there is no, again, cyclical unemployment. Okay. In other words, this is the best we can do with the resources we have. If we re reach that level, that means nothing is going to waste. You know, it's kind of like an individual um, who uh, doesn't waste any of their time. There's a certain level uh, of output that they can produce. But anyway, what is one factor that can increase real potential GDP over time? Well, there's a couple of them that we mentioned. Increases in the supply of labor and increases in the productivity of labor. Either one of these would lead that potential to increase because if there's more people around, more can be produced. But if we're, we don't have more people, but they're more productive, then obviously output will also grow as well. Okay, very good. And of course, that's what we want. We want to see output growing as fast as possible without triggering inflation, of course. Now, what can cause the supply of labor to change over time? All right, what can cause the supply to increase? Well, we can have increased hours, average hours per worker, um, an increase in the employment to population ratio, meaning more people out of the total population are working. And also the population itself can increase, an increase in the working age population. Um, an increase in the general population may not increase the supply of labor because not everybody is eligible for the workforce. Okay, so those are the three that we mentioned in the slides. All right, now when the supply of labor goes up, more people are willing to work. What's going to happen? All right, let's draw the picture. So the real wages on the vertical axis, we can think of that as the price. Now in this chapter, they used LS for labor supply and LD for labor demand, just to distinguish it from other types of supply and demand. So there's an increase in supply 
And so what's going to happen is the supply curve will shift to the right, which is always true. It doesn't matter what product we're looking at. And so the real wage actually drops. I'll call this W1 and W2, Q1 and Q2. So the graph isn't, you know, I mean, it doesn't ask for the graph, but I think it's a good idea to draw it because otherwise it's very hard to visualize this. Um, the net effect is that the real wage decreases. Okay, or, you know, you can think of it as one of two things, either the nominal wage went down or the real wage stayed the same and prices went up. But any way you look at it, the real wage will go down. Simply because there's more people willing to work and that uh, drives down the real wage. Now the aggregate production function, remember this is the um, curve that reflects the entire economy. It's just like the total product curve, except that instead of one product on the vertical axis, we have the entire economy. In other words, real GDP, and on the horizontal axis, we have the quantity of labor in the entire economy. The curve looks very similar to the total product curve, though. Uh, we don't have this downward bending region, uh, typically, but it does seem to be increasing at a progressively decreasing rate. And when we have more productive labor, of course, we can have more output at any given level of labor. Okay, so in other words, the same people can produce more products because they have more efficient equipment to work with, for example. Uh, like imagine yourself in a Starbucks and all of a sudden they decide to buy all new blenders. All of a sudden you can really crank out a lot of smoothies where before it took a while. So more productive labor for whatever reason, from technology, from more capital equipment, from better training, from more experience, will all always cause output to grow. It can only help, all right? In other words, this is what we wanna see. Now, if the demand for labor goes up, usually that's a good sign. That means the economy is stronger. It means that workers are more productive something positive has to happen in order for the demand for wages to go up or uh, the demand for labor. So we have our usual supply and demand framework, except that this time it's this demand that's changing. The demand curve shifts to the right. Okay, so you can see the demand curve shifted to the right and the net effect is that the real wage went up. So the real wage increases. Now, what is one possible cause of labor productivity going up? Well, there's a few, but increases in saving and investing in physical capital. So in other words, like I mentioned that example with Starbucks buying all new blenders for their employees, uh, that's clearly going to increase their productivity because it's um, a faster piece of equipment. Uh, or imagine where you work, um, all of a sudden the boss decides you all need new computers because you're, you're working on very old computers and your productivity is lower having better computers is certainly going to increase your productivity. Um, and also increases in human capital, which means training and education and experience. 
And of course, technology, of course, all it, it can only make things better because it's making it easier and quicker to produce goods and services with the same resources. All right, now, ooh, here's some history questions. Classical growth theory is based on the writings of which 18th century author? Now remember, this is classical growth theory, not, not you know, classical economics as such, but classical growth theory is based on the doom and gloom of Thomas Malthus. Remember who told us that the population would always grow faster than the food supply and that we're doomed to a lifetime of misery and poverty no matter what we did. That's what he said. And never, people took him seriously for a long time until the industrial revolution showed that no, productivity can rise very quickly. And so food supply can grow much more quickly than the population. But at the time he was writing, productivity was very low and it had been for many centuries. So in a lot of ways, he was just saying, what's happening now is what's going to happen in the future, not knowing that in the future, productivity would suddenly explode and that his writings would prove to be wrong. Anyway, sometimes you see his name was turned into an adjective, Malthusian. If somebody is very gloomy, sometimes they're described as being Malthusian because of the writings of Thomas Malthus. All right, now new growth theory and classical growth theory with new growth theory. I'm improving output and technology leads to increasing real GDP per capita. But with classical growth theory, population growth, in other words, with the Malthusian uh, a philosophy, population growth will always exceed gains in productivity. So, I mean, his idea was not to try to expand the economy, but to try to reduce the population growth. Um, and so that's why it was a very negative, pessimistic outlook. But then later on, of course, we saw that no, productivity can grow very, very quickly as long as we invest and save and then continue to in innovate and develop new products. So anyway, what is a way in which policymakers can stimulate economic growth? Well, there's a lot of them, but some of them were, um, Straightforward ones are creating incentives to innovate, save, work, acquire new skills. Um, encouraging research and development. So in other words, a lot of corporations receive tax breaks when they do research and development. The, the policy is that, you know, if uh, companies are developing new products that can only help overall the economy. And so it's worth their while to provide them with tax breaks. Um, improving education, of course, that's always got to be on top of the list. The better educated the population is, the more productive they will be. It's just that simple. And then finally, encouraging international trade and specialization, meaning that we all want to specialize in the products that we are most efficient in producing and therefore increase the output of goods and services throughout the world. So that would mean not interfering with trade basically. So those are all possibilities, not that the government always does those things. In fact, it often does not, but those are the ways that they could potentially encourage growth in the long run. Okay, it looks like we're done with this one. So what I think what we need to do now is we'll do the sample midterm on um, Tuesday because now we're completely done with this section five through nine. And so we're ready to do the sample midterm, which is here on Moodle. Let me just go confirm that. Yeah, I want to make sure it's there. Oh, I didn't notice that chat. We don't have class on Tuesday. Why not? Election day. Really? They've never had election day off before. I am so glad you told me. I honestly did not know that. I don't, normally they used to only have it when it was a national election. In other words, the presidential election. And then the other years, 
Where does it say that here? Hold on one second. I'm going to, I'm not, I'm not saying I don't believe you, but I want to know why I didn't know that. Um, where, where did they hide this information? We also had Columbus Day before and we started school and it was confusing because that yeah. was a holiday. Yeah. Ah, uh, okay. Oh my God, it was there. You know what? I swear I never noticed it. I'm so glad that you told me. All right, well then that of course means we'll have to save the sample midterm for next Friday. So enjoy your day off. Um, <laughs> Um, geez, because no, because you know what, they go through streaks where they like to have vacation time. Like some years they've actually had um, Columbus Day off and many years they did not. And the elections in the past, they only did this uh, during presidential elections. I did not realize they meant to keep this um, going on, but that is wild. Um, interesting. Now, of course, Thanksgiving, it's understood. It's Wednesday through Sunday. And um, that's coming up in a few weeks, obviously. And then our exam week is the week of the 13th to the 17th. Now, with an online class, we can, you know, I can just give you the, the exam anytime. Um, you know, we don't have to wait till the 13th. But all right. So, all right. So, officially, then we're going to start the sample midterm next Friday. Okay. So anyway, but in the meantime, let's get into 10. Now, this is where we're starting to look at a very different type of economics. We're looking now at what's really properly called financial economics. Um, economics is an enormously broad field. It contains a lot of subfields like, you know, international trade and finance and financial economics and monetary economics and public policy economics. And there's so many different fields within economics. But what we're going to be looking at here is a, sort of a combination of financial and monetary economics. So the focus is on a very different type of topic. And so um, some of the stuff you may already be familiar with from other classes that you've taken, but much of it is probably new. So let's get this going. It's a pretty long chapter too. There's, I broke it up into two pieces for that reason. Let's see, 10. Also though, this, this section does lend itself very nicely. I have found a lot of excellent videos for this discussion. So we'll, don't you worry, we'll be looking at them all as we go along. But um, I think you'll like this section a lot. Okay. Um, so anyway, this part, the chapter is titled Finance, Saving, and Investment. So this chapter focuses on financial markets, savings, investment, and the determination of interest rates in the marketplace. So we start out by noting, although we've seen this before, that there's two types of capital. Well, actually, there's three. Um, if you want to be technical, human capital is the one that refers to education and training and all the rest. But typically, uh, in economics, we thought of capital as being either physical capital or financial capital. So physical capital refers to machines, equipment, buildings, et cetera. They're used to produce consumer goods and services. Like I was saying before, the blenders that, that you see in Starbucks, what are they there for? Well, it's not so that the employees can have a smoothie during break time. It's so that they can sell you frozen drinks. All right. Um, or basically everything they do in that store is done with machines. Almost nothing is done by hand. And of course, you know, I mean, you, can, you can't really brew coffee without a machine, but the machinery is there to make it possible to sell you as much coffee as possible. All right. Their goal is to sell as much merchandise as they can. And so the machines are very fast and very efficient, certainly a lot faster than what you would buy for your home. Maybe not the blenders. The blenders are probably similar, but um, the coffee pots and all the rest, that, those are commercial. Um, that's commercial equipment. It's very expensive, but it can produce tons of coffee and it doesn't wear out that quickly. But that's why it's so expensive. Financial capital is completely different. Now, corporations, in order to keep running, they frequently need to raise new funds. Um, let's say you are Apple and you've decided it's high time that you started developing the Apple uh, iPhone 14. Well, that's going to cost you some money. 
You have to pay people to do the research and development. You have to pay company, um, you have to get it manufactured somewhere. There's all kinds of expenses involved when building the iPhone 14. Where do you get the money from? Well, most likely that Apple will get the money by issuing stocks, which the public will buy and provide them with funds. And when people buy Apple stock, they're providing funding to the company. And what is Apple providing to the people who buy their stocks, by the way? Why do you and I like to buy Apple stock? What benefit does it give us? Does anyone know? Well, you share their profits. When you buy a share of Apple stock, you are actually a part owner of the company. Literally, you own a piece of the company. And so what happens is when the company does well, the stock price goes up and you can sell it for a profit. And so this is why people buy stocks. They, they hope that the stock price will go up and it certainly will if the company is doing well. So if they take your money and use it to build the iPhone 14 and it's successful, the stock price will go up and you'll find yourself with a nice little profit. The other way that they can raise money is to issue a, a security, which is called a bond. And a bond is simply a way of borrowing money from uh, investors. In other words, if I buy an Apple bond, I'm not sharing in the company's profits. What's happening is they pay me interest every year for a fixed number of years, and eventually they re repay me the money that I lent them. So either way, if, they, if Apple issues stocks or bonds, the funds that they're raising are referred to as financial capital, and they need it to continue running their business, okay? They can't just rest on their laurels. They have to be continuously developing new products, expanding into new markets. Um, you know, maybe they've decided to build more Apple stores in South America, for example. That's going to cost a lot of money. So this is a very expensive proposition, and they frequently raise the money from outside sources, meaning stocks and bonds. They can borrow from banks too, but usually that's only for short-term purposes. If they need long-term money, in other words, if they're building new factories, for example, most likely they'll raise that money by issuing either stocks or bonds. And that money in turn is called financial capital. Now, investment spending when a corporation is investing, what they're basically doing is, like I was saying a minute ago, developing new products, uh, maybe improving their efficiency by, let's say, buying a whole new set of computers for their employees, or maybe they are moving into new markets. Whatever it is they're doing to increase their future earnings is known as investment. Okay. Um, so like I was saying before, if Apple decides to build a bunch of new stores in South America, that would be called investment because they're trying to expand their ability to sell products in the future. Now, depreciation, you've all experienced depreciation if you own a car. What does that word mean? What do we mean by that? If you have a car, what happens to its value over time? Does anyone know? It decreases, it decreases. yes. Why does it decrease? Be well, yes. well, it's be like, like you said, if it's a car, uh, it depreciates. Like when you buy that car and you used it, uh -huh. It's no longer, you know, new. Is being used. Is being, you know, throughout time is being worn down, pretty much. And it exactly. kind of value kind of depreciates. depreciates. Yes, that's exactly right. Devin, were you going to say that? <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. So if you bought, if you, um, if you have a car, um, let's say you've had it for two years, is it worth as much as it was two years ago? No, because you've been driving it and there's more mileage on it and the value has gone down. So the correct name for that process is depreciation. Now, if you're a corporation, let's say you're Starbucks and you're using blenders every day, obviously they're gonna wear out eventually. So in the, in the process, we call that depreciation. They will have to be replaced eventually. Now, from the corporation's perspective, um, they get tax breaks for doing this though. In other words, if they have equipment that is worn out and they have to replace it, they can get a tax break for the equipment that they replaced. Um, so it's less of a problem, but for us, you know, when your car loses value, well, you just have to buy a new car every so often. But this is something that has to be taken into account when we measure how much investment is taking place in the economy. Some of the investment is for brand new things that we need, but some of it is just uh, designed to take the place of worn out 
or uh, no longer usable equipment. So funds that are acquired used to spend uh, on new capital are called gross investment. Net investment means the gross investment minus the depreciation. So here's a nice example of this. Starbucks spends $10,000 in new equipment of which 1,000 is spent to replace a worn out blender. So while they spent $10,000 on their investment, only nine of it represents an actual increase in their new equipment, okay? In other words, they spent 10 grand, but one of that is used to replace an existing blender. So their increase in um, capital equipment is actually only $9,000. So we call that net investment. And that's the number that helps the economy grow, by the way. If net investment is very strong, then that means that um, corporations uh, should be able to earn more profits in the future and produce more goods and services. So this is what we like to see, a lot of investment. Okay, now wealth versus income. This is a very confusing distinction. Um, wealth means how much money do you have right now in the bank? Income means how much do you earn during a given year? So the distinction between the two is that wealth is a certain constant amount that you already have, and income is how much you bring in every year. And so it's an important distinction, which is often lost if you ever noticed if you're watching uh, TV and they're talking about uh, financial or economic matters. Um, a lot of people are easily confused by this distinction. It's very important to understand the difference between the two. So like here, for example, imagine a person who has $10,000 in the bank. That is considered to be wealth. If the same person has a salary of $100,000 a year, that would be considered income. So they're two very different things. Now, they, if they spend all of their income on expenses, their wealth will never change. It just stays at $10,000. But the income means how much do we bring in every year? And in economics, that means wealth is defined as what we will call a stock variable because it defines how much we have at a single point in time. And income is, is, is called a flow variable because it represents the flow of dollars per unit of time. So stock means a fixed amount at a given point in time. Flow means how much money is either coming in or going out during a given time period. It's a subtle but important distinction. Now we also have these concepts, when you buy a share of stock and the price goes up, we formally call that a capital gain, okay? So the word capital gains means that you buy a financial asset and it goes up in value. If the stock goes down though, the opposite happens and you refer to that as a capital loss. And of course, if you own stock, you know that, that both of them happen on a regular basis. Sometimes the price goes up, sometimes it goes down. When the price goes up, you're enjoying a capital gain. When the price goes down, you're suffering a capital loss. All right. So yes, that's all that it means. Now, the markets for financial capital, where, as I was mentioning earlier, imagine you're Apple and you need more money to develop the iPhone 14. Where can you get this money? Well, we can either borrow it from a bank in the market for loans, we can issue bonds to the public, and we can issue stocks to the public. Okay, now all three of these have their advantages and disadvantages to the uh, corporation. And so typically corporations will use some of each. You know, it's very rare that they only lean on one of these sources for all of their capital needs because they have different requirements, they have different tax implications. And some of them are meant for the long term, some of them are meant for the short term. So in the loan market, if a bank, let's say you're Apple and you need to buy a bunch of materials for your iPhone 14. Uh, let's say you need to buy whatever metal they use to make the chip in the, in the phone. Um, a lot of the materials in an iPhone are very hard to find. They only are found in certain countries like um, Africa and China, um, rare minerals, um, are, are, you know, and, and it's not easy to find them. So if Apple needs to buy a new stock of this rare metal, um, 
they might decide to go to the bank and borrow money because they're going to use that material right away to, to build new iPhones and hopefully sell them right away. So um, short-term expenses like their utilities, like their salaries, you know, if they're running short on cash, they might go to the bank and borrow some money. They don't want to ever be in a position where they can't pay their bills. So for short-term bills, things that are due right away, they might turn to the banks and, and borrow money. Now, of course, individuals go to the banks to borrow more expensive items, long-term items like cars and furniture and appliances and homes. Um, anything that might take a while to pay it back, most likely you'll acquire that money from a bank. Uh, I mean, in principle, you could wait to have enough money saved up. But I mean, if you need a new car, what if it takes you five years to save up the money to buy a car? You can't be walking around for five years. You've got to have that car. So you'll go to the bank most likely and borrow that money. Uh, same thing with the house. I mean, you've got to live somewhere. So, um, you know, the, the, the good thing about the banks is that you can have whatever it is you want right away, and then you pay for it over the long run. So this is a good uh, way for individuals to borrow money for long-term expenses and for corporations to borrow money for short-term expenses. Now, bonds. So a bond is a security, which once you buy it, you, own, you, have a piece of, you have a document in your hands which says that you have lent money to Apple, let's say, and Apple will promise to pay you X dollars a year in interest for uh, typically 30 years. And then when the 30 years are up, they'll repay you the money that you lent them. So it's basically a contract that you're entering into when you buy a bond. Now, it used to be that when you bought a bond, you were actually given a physical certificate Let's say it's not, let's say right now it's not 2021, but it's 1921. And of course, Apple didn't exist at the time. So let's say you buy a US steel bond. Here's what's going to happen. Let me see if I can find a picture of this. Okay, oh, here we go. Perfect. I don't know if I can make that any bigger. Oh, it's taking its sweet time, that's for sure. Let's see what we can do here. Um, Okay, well, the quality is kind of deteriorating, but you can see it says United States Steel Corporation, and it also says they're 100. So basically, this is a $100 bond. And I can't quite make out the date, but if JP Morgan signed it, that means this is the early part of the 20th century. And you buy this bond, you pay $100 to US Steel, and they give you the certificate, and it spells out on the bond how much interest they're going to pay you every year. And how long it will be before they give you your money back. So let's say, for example, and again, I can't really read it that well, but let's just say um, the bond is issued in 1920 with a face value of $100. The um, interest is uh, 3% per year. So what that means is that, oh, and the bond matures in 30 years. So what that means is that each year until 1950, US Steel <coughs> will pay the owner or the investor 3% times $100, which is $3 a year. In interest. And then in 1950, US Steel <coughs> will refund the $100 paid for the bond. Okay, so 
In other words, you start out by paying $100 to U.S. Steel. They promise to pay you 3% a year in interest for 30 years. And when the 30 years are up, you get your money back. So in effect, it is a lot like lending money to U.S. Steel. The difference being, though, with a loan, I mean, it's, a, it's an arrangement between you and the lender, or the borrower, rather. In this case, if we decide at some point uh, that we need the money right away, we can sell this bond to another investor. Okay, so you don't really have to wait 30 years to get your money back if you don't want to. Um, and then whoever owns the bond in 1950 will get the $100. But, you know, in those days, this was done with physical paper certificates. This would come in the mail and you would say, this is the proof that I own this bond. Well, now, of course, everything's done with computers. You would have an account and this bond would show up in your account and you would see that you have this bond that's paying you $3 a year in interest. Now, what's interesting is that these bond certificates were designed to be impressive. They wanted you to think the company was doing really well. So they really went out of their way to make them as attractive as possible. And in fact, some people do collect historical uh, bond and stock certificates because they're that interesting. And um, in fact, there used to be a museum in Manhattan that had a huge collection of these. They, uh, their building was destroyed by flooding and they're still looking for a new home. But um, anyway, so this is what a bond actually looked like. Now, of course, it's just a purely electronic transaction. And if you go through here, you'll see there's a lot of others like um, that one is National Steel. I don't know them, but that's National Steel. And you can go through and you can find all kinds of interesting bond certificates. Um, you could probably find, for example, an AT&T bond. There's one right there. American Telegraph, this one is 1956, AT&T, um, of course, the telephone company. And it's the same principle, it's a bond. And um, if you bought this, you would be receiving interest payments until the maturity date. All right, so that's, that's what bonds are all about. Now, the government also issues bonds, which are called treasuries, and uh, they do that not to raise funding because you know a corporation is using this funding to finance their operations. The government is issuing bonds to cover their deficits. So just like with private corporations, you used to receive a physical certificate if you bought a treasury security. Like this one. And again, I can hardly see that. Let me just see if we can get a picture of it. And then make it a little bigger. Oh uh, boy. Maybe I can get a bigger picture. Oh boy. Oh, for God's sake. Uh, well, here's an article. I mean, you can read this. Oh, maybe we can get this picture. Ah, look at that. I managed to make it a little. Here we go. So you can see this is a wow, $100,000 US Treasury bill. Um, it was ex issued on October 9th, 1969, and it was due and payable. Now, this is a treasury bill. That means that it has typically a very short maturity date. This is only for six months. So you're basically lending the government $100,000 for six months. And um, what normally would happen with these is that instead of them paying you an interest payment, what would happen is they would sell it to you at a reduced price. Like, let's say they sold this to you for $99,000. In six months, they would give you back $100,000. And so you'd make a profit of $1,000 instead of an interest payment. And so because it's such a short uh, period of time, that's how they normally would uh, handle this. Now, for longer security uh, treasury, like um, they do have 30-year treasuries 
Instead, you would actually get interest payments just like a corporate bond. Ah, now here's one. This is going back to the 70s, it looks like. This one is worth $5,000. And this one is a treasury note. Now, oh, okay. Well, let's wait. <laughs> um, let me just quickly detour into, let me just give you a quick little uh, side note here about this treasury market. Um, just because this is in, important, um, in the treasury market, there are three basic types of bonds you can buy. So the one we just saw, the treasury bill has a maturity of one year or less. Okay, the Treasury note has a maturity of anywhere from two to 10 years. And then a treasury bond has a maturity between 20 and 30 years. So that's how the names work. A treasury bill, remember that one we saw that was going to expire in six months? That was a treasury bill. The one that we're trying to look at now, but it's taking forever, is a treasury note. Oh, it says it right there, a treasury note. And you can see that this is a 10-year treasury note because it was issued in August of 1976. and um, it was a, due to mature in August of 1986. So it's a 10-year treasury note. The interest rate is 8%. So this is a $5,000 note. So every year, 8% of that is uh, $400. And that's how much interest you would have been receiving every year as long as you own this bond. Or uh, it's actually a treasury note. Now, here's an interesting feature. In order to collect your interest payments, if you look carefully down here, we have these little strips down here. And again, it's kind of small. When February 15th, 1986 rolled around, what they were offering to do is say, listen, instead of making you wait all year to get your interest payments, we'll give you $200 twice a year. All right, twice a year, we'll give you 200 instead of 400 once a year. So one of these payments was due on February 15th, 1986. So when the time came, what you were expected to do is take a pair of scissors and cut out this little strip and send it back to them. And then they would send you a check for $200. <laughs> you can imagine how awkward that must have been. So because of that, and by the way, what does this remind you of? Um, if you ever go to the supermarket and they have, um, you pay for your merchandise and they print out your receipt, they also print out these little coupons that are good for you know, let's say discounts on other merchandise. So those are referred to as coupons. And so these uh, little strips of paper where, that you redeem for your interest are also called coupons because they are actual physical coupons. And so even to this day, the interest payments on a bond are referred to as coupon payments because historically, this is how you were paid your interest. You were given these coupons to cash in um, when the time came for a payment to be made. So this is a very interesting historical note because somebody did not cash in their uh, coupons. You can see they're still on the bond. And so this is how it worked up until fairly recently, as a matter of fact. I think you could still get these until the 90s. But now, of course, it's all done on computers. So you never have any physical coupons. But they're still called that, coupons. And that's the reason why. Interesting. <laughs> coupons. So the next time you get a coupon in the mail from your supermarket, you'll think about this. It's, it's basically the same idea. You use it to either uh, collect interest or to save money. All right. Well, anyway, but yes, like I was saying, there are collectors. You can actually go to there are different websites. Um, you can, well, I mean, in principle, you can collect anything, but there are many people out there who do collect historical bond and stock certificates. And so they would love to own a copy of this one, but it's probably, it's not that old. It's probably not that expensive, but some of the older ones can get very, very expensive. 
All right. Well, anyway, but remember, um, the corporations issue bonds in order to raise money for their operations. Tre the government issues these bonds to cover their deficits. Okay. So investors buy them and they're basically lending money to the government in exchange for interest or coupon payments. All right. But all bonds, no matter who issues them, have certain things in common. For example, the um, price at which it's sold, like here, for example, that would be the $5,000. And that is known as either the face or the par value of the bond. Now, typically, uh, this one is $5,000. That's fairly uncommon. Mostly, these are issued with prices or face values of either $1,000, 10000 or maybe 100000 occasionally a $1 million, but it's usually a multiple of $1,000. So that's how much you pay to buy it when it's first issued, and that's how much you get back on the maturity date. Now, the coupon rate, well, now we know what that means. The coupon rate is this 8% here. That means 8% of this face value of $5,000 is how much we'll pay you in interest every year. In this case, that would be $400. But by convention, they typically pay you half of that twice a year, so you're going to get two payments every year of $200 rather than one payment of $400. So that percentage is known as the coupon rate. Okay, 8% here. Then the coupon is the dollar value of that payment. Here, that would be defined as $400. Okay, 8% of 5,000 is $400. That would be the size of the coupon payment. Although, like I said, most likely they would split that in half, but the actual coupon itself is $400. And then the maturity on this one, the maturity is August 15, 1986, exactly 10 years later. And um, that's how long it'll take before you'll get the $5,000 back. Okay, so you're basically lending the government $5,000 for 10 years. And in the meantime, they owe you $400 a year in coupon payments. So it is a loan, but like I said before, unlike a normal bank loan, I can sell this to somebody else if I want my money back sooner. All right, now call provisions. Now this is an interesting idea. Corporate bonds at least typically have a provision that says we can buy this bond back from you anytime we want, which makes you wonder why would they ever do that? I mean, they went out of their way to borrow your money. Why would they offer to pay it back to you before the due date? It typically means that interest rates have gone down. Like imagine this bond was issued in 1976 for 8%. Suppose that a year later, interest rates drop in the economy and they can now issue these notes with only a 7% coupon rate. Well, they don't want to keep paying you 8% every year for the next 10 years. So what they will do is they'll tell you, we're going to buy your bond back, and then we're going to replace it with a 7% note. Now, you might say to yourself, why would I ever want to buy a bond if that's the case? Because what they have to do then is in order to entice you to buy the bond, the coupon rate will be higher than it would have been had they not included this call feature. So in other words, they're basically saying, we're gonna give you more interest than we ordinarily would, but at any time we can take it back from you. And so there's a risk involved. So you're getting more interest, at least initially, and then you're taking the risk that they might take the bond back when rates start to go down. Now, a put provision is the opposite case where the bond owner can sell it back to the seller anytime they please. That, that would only happen if interest rates went up and the owner wants to buy a new bond that has a higher interest payment or a coupon payment. Now, all of this information is contained in a contract that you enter into when you buy a bond. The contract is called an indenture. So whenever you enter into a, or buy a bond, you're entering into a contract known as an indenture. 
And that indenture tells you all these details like the par value, the coupon rate, the coupon, the maturity, all of these details are contained in the indenture so that you know exactly what you're getting into. All right, so um, I just wanna briefly mention that there are many different issuers of bonds. Um, corporations are a major issuer of bonds, the treasury department, as we've seen, but also city, state, and local governments can issue their own bonds and they're called municipal bonds. For example, when the, uh, in Westchester, when they built the new Tappan Zee Bridge, it would have been financed with bonds issued by the state of New York because it's a local project. It's not nothing to do with the federal government. Um, so those would have been municipal bonds. And then finally, we have foreign bonds, which are issued by either foreign governments or foreign corporations. Okay. So those are all the different sources of bonds in the US bond markets. So you can buy any one of these through a broker. And of course, they all have advantages and disadvantages. They, they have different coupon rates. They have different levels of risk. Um, they have different features built into them. They have different tax treatments. So the one you end up buying has to depend on your particular circumstances. So um, let's see, what should we do? Well, now here's all the different, oh boy, this is a fairly complicated discussion, so I don't wanna rush through it. But given that we have, oh God, Tuesday is off. Um, so I'll tell you what we'll do. Next week on Friday, what we'll do is we'll go over the sample midterm number two, and then we'll dive back into this extremely interesting topic, in my opinion, and we'll learn more about bonds and stocks and other financial securities and then what we're going to turn our focus to is how interest rates are determined in the marketplace. Interest rates affect every financial security in the marketplace. The value of every security is related to the level of interest rates. So this is an incredibly important topic. And then in chapter 11, when we get to it, we'll start looking at money. And then we're going to look at the Federal Reserve System and how it sets interest rates in the economy. So we've got a very interesting path ahead of us including a day off on Tuesday. So I'll tell you what, I guess we can stop right about here. And um, don't forget, we're off on Tuesday. I'll send you a reminder. If It's possible that some people in the class didn't know, or maybe I'm the only one who didn't know. And then we'll carry on with the sample midterm next Tuesday. Okay. So um, I hope you found this interesting. And, you know, anytime you want to, you know, with Google, um, you can look up anything you want. Um, you can go look at all these wonderful historical bonds and um, you can look at stock certificates. You can find out so much wonderful information in a hurry. And this is all very interesting. Um, you know, U.S. financial history is a very interesting subject. And uh, so anyway, uh, I guess uh, I'll see you on, on, if there's no last minute questions, I'll see you all on Friday. Thank oh, you. You're welcome. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. All right. See you later. Thank you. Okay, bye. Have a good weekend. Okay, you too.